Jonathan Swift's writing is going to be, I think, really interesting for us to consider, particularly his modest proposal, which some of you have read um, before and are already familiar with. Some of you have never encountered it before, um, and so I'm looking forward to hearing your reactions to it. It brings up all kinds of issues about language, class, education, cultural perception, cultural awareness that are exciting to talk about, and I'm looking forward to discussing all of these things with you in today's lecture, but I actually want to start this lecture on um, Swift by turning aside for a moment to reconsider Milton and to reconsider our discussion about Paradise Lost and what's so significant about Paradise Lost. And as I was discussing Paradise Lost, one of the things I pointed out was that Milton was kind of taking on kind of directly the history and the significance of Latin as the language to communicate meaningful stories uh, culturally meaningful stories um, in terms of his own kind of historical background about the Bible, biblical tales, those kinds of issues, and how Milton was using language in a very dramatic, very powerful way to claim some of the space, uh, some of the theological space, some of the imaginative space that Latin has so long uh, dominated, had dominated for so long in culture, and he was doing it with English, which was in and of itself kind of remarkable. And so one of the reasons why I like Paradise Lost so much, and one of the reasons why Paradise Lost is so significant to this course is that it shows us a poet using English to kind of stretch into territory that had long been dominated by, you know, another language or languages other than English uh, significantly um, in the centuries leading up to the moment when Paradise Lost actually emerges. When we get into Swift's modest proposal, one of the things we're going to see today, one of the things we're going to be, I think, thinking about is how can English be used to kind of reach out um, into the future um, to affect how it is people perceive the world they live in, think about other people in the world, and how they organize themselves socially, politically, you know, culturally, economically, and all these things. Not that those implications aren't latent in Milton, but they're certainly significant to Swift. But before we can talk about Swift and Swift's modest proposal, we need to think about a couple of things, and I'll try to talk about them rather briefly because there's really nothing less funny than talking about humor, than talking about jokes. And when you read Modest Proposal, you might find yourself horrified, you might find yourself aghast, and there are horrifying things said in Modest Proposal, but you need to understand that they're not being said uh, deliberately, well, they're being said deliberately, but they're not being said with the intention that they actually be carried out. All right, so when we read Modest Proposal, and if you haven't read it yet, I would encourage you to stop watching this video and to go read Modest Proposal, get through it, come to the end of it, and then come back to the video because what I'm going to say now will fundamentally um, perhaps ruin your experience with that text, okay? Um, so go read it. Don't listen to me right now. Don't think I'm going to help you. I'm not. It's not going to make it any easier to understand in terms of what your initial reaction with the text should be. So I would get underscore that if you haven't stopped the video yet, stop it, go read it, come back to the video, okay? So I'm now assuming that you've taken my advice, and if you haven't, that's the choice that you've made. So when you read a modest proposal and you understand that here we have this wonderful voice that suggests a very specific, rational, logical plan for dealing with essentially unwanted children in Ireland, and that answer is, of course, that we eat them, that they be eaten so that they be made socially useful. Okay, so when you read Modest Proposal, you, you are, you know, both horrified, but you're also something else. And you may be, may be disgusted and horrified, but you're also something else. And, and the something else, which right now we'll say is kind of nebulous and hard to nail down, is what is so important about this piece. All right, so many people look at a modest proposal as an excellent example of a very early kind of irony in English writing. And irony is a... Um, a quality of writing, a quality of culture that is not necessarily held in the same kind of high esteem uh, across the globe as it has traditionally been held within English-speaking communities, particularly English-speaking communities post-Swift, right? And so the whole trick of irony is for, you know, someone to say one thing while in fact they mean quite the opposite. Okay, so uh, something is, of course, always ironic if you do something in the pursuit of one certain goal, but then in the pursuit of that goal, you end up actually causing that thing 
to happen. So for example, I might be terrified of thieves, so it would be ironic if I tried to make my house as secure as possible, but in the course of making my house as secure as possible, the security guards were in fact thieves and they got into my house that way. That would be an ironic chain of events, right? An ironic situation. Well, ironic speech, ironic conversation comes about when somebody says something um, indicating one thing, but we know that they actually mean the opposite. And it's that awareness, that ability to tell that the speaker is saying one thing, but they actually mean something quite the opposite, that is so uh, kind of wonderfully kind of particular, not just to English, but it certainly is a, a significant um, uh, a component of English communication, particularly in the contemporary period, but also certainly to the writers that we've been looking at um, uh, recently in this course. But Swift is, is a master of this, of saying one thing to us, but we understand he means something else. So when you finish Modest Proposal, or as you're reading Modest Proposal, let's think there's two kind of ways to read this text. There's probably more than two, but just for the sake of argument and for explanation, let's just say there's two. So you start reading a Modest Proposal, and you start thinking, well, yes, this, this is quite the plan that you have for unwanted children and for the poor. We should eat them. Well, I understand your reasoning, but, you know, eating them is a little extreme. Okay, that's somebody who fundamentally misunderstands the document that they're, that they're looking at, right? Because when you're reading a modest proposal, one of the things you're, you're supposed to be aware of is that, of course, this is not what Swift is saying. And what Swift is doing is trying to point out just how bad the situation is, just how dehumanized, uh, or, or just how little we have been valuing, and by we, I mean the English, have been valuing the people of, of, of Ireland, so that something like this could even be remotely entertained. Um, just shows how disgusting the relations have become between the English and the Irish at this point in time. So what Swift is doing is he's making this extreme case to point out all the things that are wrong between kind of Irish and English relations at the time. And again, how little the English are valuing the lives um, of the Irish in Ireland. So you read Modest Proposal and you understand that from the very beginning, it's not being serious with you. This isn't a modest proposal. This is a horrifying proposal. This is an upsetting proposal. This is a disturbing proposal. And it's by its, uh, it's, it, it's effective to the extent that the unnerving nature of the piece kind of, kind of hits home, right? And as you come through this, you're like, okay, I have this sense of just how little one group of people values another group of people. And Swift does that by creating this kind of fantastical narrator who is explaining his reasoning to us. It's all very logical. Um, the, th the things he say all seem to make sense, except, of course, for the fact that the outcome or the end result of all these actions is incredibly monstrous, incredibly inhuman, incredibly despicable. Um, and there's a bunch of ways you could approach this subject. You could think about it, you know, in, in contemporary culture um, uh, with the current refugee crisis. You know, we value these refugees so little that um, we would come to some agreement that not even toddlers should be allowed across the border because the toddlers could be, you know, well, they're suspicious for some reason. Um, it's that kind of extreme reasoning that gives us pause, that is gut-churning, that is upsetting, and that really underscores what it means to be a human being and what it means to act in a way that is, you know, in, in a way that coheres to basic conceptions of humanism and humanity and to have empathy for other human beings. And we sometimes need to be kind of shocked into that kind of awareness, right? We can very easily, perhaps in some scenarios, forget who it is we're talking about or when we talk about the management of other people in other places and what should be done with other people. We sometimes forget that what we're talking about is other human beings and that our comments have significant implications for them. But let's back up away from that just for a few seconds to return to this concept of irony because irony is also something that we need to think about as being something of a luxury. And it's a luxury that you can see people either acquire or fail to acquire in your own everyday life. And here's how you can be aware of that. You know, there's a strong, there's a strong relationship, a very strong relationship with an individual's cultural perceptions, some sense of the depth and breadth of the culture that they inhabit, and their ability to understand irony, to infer irony from the comments of others, to see it in other people's actions, 
uh, and, and get it in humor. If somebody has a very limited cultural perception, and by that it is always relative, but, but by that I mean they don't have a, much of a sense of the broader world within which they live, they don't have much of a broader sense of how their individual actions impact the daily lives of other people, or how the actions of people who are beyond the immediate scope of their daily adventures also have impact on them. These tend to be individuals who have a really hard time recognizing irony. These tend to be individuals who will take kind of all statements to be, you know, straightforward, declarative, um, uh, direct, uh, with no other possible interpretation or no other possible interpretations. And someone in this scenario has a very hard time understanding and detecting irony. Irony, of course, requires us to do something. It requires us to hear and it requires us to ask whether or not what is being said is reasonable, whether or not what is being said is rational. Most people can do that, but it also asks us to think about the social situation in which something is being said, the cultural situation in which something is being said. Does it make sense for this person to say this thing? If the answer is yes, the answer is yes. If the answer is no, then we begin to wonder why is it that this individual is saying these things? So why is it that Jonathan Swift, who has all these associations with Ireland and living in Ireland and standing up for the Irish, why is it that he suddenly says, you know what we should do? We should eat their babies. Well, okay, what's going on here? If you don't have the cultural clues, if you don't have the cultural awareness to reflect on what is being said and whether or not it makes any sense, then you completely lose the ability to understand irony and whether or not someone is speaking to you in a kind of straightforward manner, or if perhaps they're speaking to you in a way that, that assumes you're going to understand that what they're saying is not literal is not direct. And we see this most often in our culture with sarcasm. Sarcasm and irony aren't necessarily the same thing, though they are very closely linked. Most of us understand sarcasm pretty well, Maine being a very sarcastic state. In fact, I would say that most people, uh, Mainers in the state of Maine, would be much more readily uh, able to recognize sarcasm than perhaps irony. When I'm talking about sarcasm, I'm simply saying something in a way that um, creates some sense of dif some sense of discomfort, usually intentionally. So you know, are you happy with you know your selection of courses this semester? And you might say, oh, you know, I'm really really satisfied with my courses. Okay, well in that situation, it's very obvious that what I'm saying is is different than reality, and and technically that is irony. But in you know, in the sense we do it through speaking, in the sense we do it through speech, or interpersonal communication, there's a lot of eye rolling, there's usually some change in the level of the voice, there's usually, you know, physical gestures that go along with it. There are a lot of tells that what I'm saying is very different than what I actually mean, okay? So I'm being sarcastic, but I'm kind of animating that for you in case you can't pick up on it. Irony, um, in, the ter in terms of Jonathan Swift, of course can be expressed verbally, but oftentimes we have to be aware that irony also comes to us in the form of prose, in the form of poetry, and the question is, how do I decipher what's in front of me? Well, it requires that you are aware enough of the subject that you're engaging, that you have some sense of, of who they are, the social conditions they're speaking in, and whether or not what they're saying makes any sense, given the, you know, the background they have, given their political interests, given their social interests. Now, when you read something as extreme as a modest proposal, right? it really shouldn't matter what the background of the person is because it's so blatantly berserk. You know, cannibalism and incest being essentially the two fundamental taboos in Western culture, you know, dating all the way back to uh, the ancient Greeks um, and their fundamental stories in which, you know, cannibalism and, tab and, and incest are the two things that, more so than any others, kind of push people beyond the realms of what is acceptable by committing the crimes associated with these things. Um, so when you read Maude's proposal, most, you know, any general reader, um, any general reader of English is going to understand that what's being said is highly, um, highly uh, undesirable. 
Okay. Um, the, the, the tragic thing, of course, though, is how close what Swift is saying, or, or what the basic effects of are that Swift is saying, and, and how oftentimes it is in society where you'll have proposals about how children should be kept or not kept. And I'm not talking about eating here, but how it is we take care of each other, how it is we make sure people have the things that they need in society, that they have enough food to eat, that they have a place to sleep, that they have a sense of safety in their lives, that they have some sense of purpose and direction, that they have some sense of security, um, that you know the things they know today will also be true tomorrow. It's, it's astounding and, and always disheartening when you hear in society, um, for any number of reasons, people arguing about how we'll, we'll deal with other people and basically take these things away. And one of the things that's so wonderful about a modest proposal is that it shows us how easy and how rational it is to treat people in inhumane ways. And this is really the second major point I want to talk about today. Swift's document is wonderful you know, for its humor and its use of irony to make us uncomfortable with the ways in which the English are treating the Irish um, people at the time. But it's also a wonderful document in that it really underscores how reason can lead us to do horrifying things to each other. When you read Modest Proposal and you, and you look at the logic that's being expressed to you, okay, putting aside for a second the disgusting implications of cannibalism, when you read through the piece, it's fairly reasonable, and please hear the air quotes, and please see my air quotes, to say, well, based upon what he's saying, you know, this would be one way to make these people productive if they were to be eaten by society because financially they cost all these things and socially they cost all these things so why not just eat them again at that point your basic human uh, impulses should rise up and say that's repulsive that's horrifying that's unnerving that's despicable that's cowardly that's vengeful that's mean that's evil uh, and in some ways, I would say a modest proposal makes us much more aware of what evil actually is than John Milton's Paradise Lost, uh, because it comes out of the mouth of a human being in a modest proposal. Uh, you hear people rationalizing, or the narrator in a way is rationalizing towards cannibalism and landing there quite effectively with all kinds of supports. You know, you could take a modest proposal and you could run it through basically all the tests for good writing that we here at Husson teach in our rhetoric and composition classes and that many of you have taken and you can check off the list and, and, and Swift kind of, you know, scores big time in every category. He has claims, he has evidence, he has warrants, he has examples that go along with all of this. He contextualizes, he rebuts, he has qualifiers, he has all of these things that, you know, Toulmin style argumentation has, even though it's developed as by that name in a much later date, he does all of it. And he puts out this very well-reasoned argument for why we should eat uh, the children of Irish people and, and, and others perhaps as well. Um, so this, is, this hopefully um, is a good thing for us to read right now because as we move further into the course, several more of our writers, certainly when we get to Evan Burke, there's this... This, this value placed on reason as being um, kind of the fundamental uh, concept or a fundamental concept for organizing and maintaining society. And one of the things when we, when we get to Burke, one of the things we're going to see Burke do very famously, uh, Edmund Burke, very famously uses reason to completely um, uh, argue for, completely is kind of a useless word there, but he tries to rationalize towards a stable monarchy, okay, and, and, and explains why we need a stable monarchy and the purpose of a stable monarchy and how a monarchy benefits civilization, and he's not talking ironically. He is talking as if this is the plan for the future. And he's talking about this in the light of the, the French terror and all kinds of other issues. But when you read Edmund Burke today and you're not a monarchist, which I'm assuming that you're not, some of you watching these in some countries may be monarchists, I don't know, but my students at Huston are not monarchists, right? Probably not monarchists. Uh, but if you are, that's your choice. But most Americans would find it hilarious to argue for a monarch or to have a rationale for one individual to be divinely situated uh, culturally, socially, spiritually above everybody else in society. It's not a fundamental American value, but it is a situation 
that, as we'll see, Burke reasons us towards, and he gives us all the reasons for it, and it ends with, with the monarch, and we'll be talking about that in different ways as well. Swift is also using reason to make a point, to make a claim, and that claim and that point are both terrifying. And the difference between the two is that when we read Swift, who's hilarious, um, one of the things we need to be aware of is that he doesn't mean this. It's not, it's not a legitimate claim he's making about how the Irish should be valued or treated in society. So when, when you look at Swift, and even if you don't get much else from him, I'd ask you to do this. I'd ask you to think about other writers we've read this semester, and you know, do we get a sense of irony from any of them? And I would, I don't want to discount the possibility that irony exists elsewhere, but there's, there are very few instances where, um, let's take Andrew Marvell for example. You know, you look at To His Coy Mistress, and one of the things you can walk away from is that, you know, the speaker is using all kind of flowery metaphors and, and language, is language to convince, uh, and language to persuade, and language to seduce. But he's saying exact, exactly what he wants, which is that he wants to have a con continual kind of on-demand sex with the woman he is speaking to. And you can look at the flea. And in the flea, is there any irony there? No, there's no real irony there. I mean, he is kind of fudging things a bit because he's saying, well, there's this flea that rationalizes why we should have a sexual relationship. But he's being very straightforward about the fact that he wants to have sex with this individual. Is there irony in Milton? Uh, is there irony in his personification of the devil? Well, there really can't be if we're going to take that piece seriously. I mean, when we read Paradise Lost, you have to have the sense that here's the devil, here's Satan, here's what he wants, he's going to go get it now. And, and Milton isn't being ironic in his characterization of that of that demon. Um, the same thing is true of Shakespeare. Look at Sonnet 1, 2, 3. Um, no, time, and so on. Is this ironic? And We'd have to say, if this is ironic, this is one of the greatest tragedies in the English language. Here we have this very intense uh, declaration from an incredibly passionate perspective about the artist's desire to withstand the passage of time. And if it's ironic, let's ball up this course and throw it away and we, we can walk away at the end of the day. And that's okay because those artists aren't using irony to the same effect. And what Swift is trying to do many things here, but one of the things he's trying to do is to make people aware of the horror of the current political situation by drawing their attention to a basically this basic point, let's carry this out to its logical conclusion, right? So if we're going to devalue the Irish, let's just, let's just see where that goes. So if we say they're worth essentially nothing and they're not essentially human, then wouldn't it be fine just to eat them? Um, because we do that with other animals, and if the Irish aren't people, then there's really no taboo. Um, the same thing is being said, you know, the, the same, the, the, the political power of irony is enormous, and your awareness of it as a student and as a thinker and as a writer, I would say is fundamental to your kind of invitation to the greater conversation your culture is having about language and people and places and things and what we value and what we don't. So if you lack the ability to recognize irony when it hits you in the face, you're not only missing out on a lot of great jokes, but you're fundamentally missing out on a very powerful system of, uh, a very powerful uh, system is maybe the wrong word, but a very powerful practice uh, speakers of English have for drawing attention to political realities that are upsetting or distressing, okay? And Swift does that so wonderfully here by taking the logic of Irish subjugation, Irish dismissal, uh, Irish ethnic cleansing, and he says, okay, if you really want to treat these people like they're just merely burdens, then why don't we just um, start to eat them? And you, of course, at that moment realize that you can't just start to eat them because they are human beings, and you at that moment realize the possibility that you have perhaps, and talking culturally here, been mistreating um, a large group of people in horrifying ways for an extended period of time. And I'd like to close with a call here, and I don't do this very often in, in lecture videos, but you know, if you take Swift's logic regarding the Irish and you start to think about you know, contemporary people and political situations, you know, what happens if I take my logic of degradation, segregation, expulsion, and I apply it um, to such a group, and I ask, well, what, what, what could we do with these people if we didn't even worry about whether or not they were human beings? And the answer is, of course, you can do anything. And that, of course, is the upsetting moment, right? And one of the things it should do and does do 
thanks to Jonathan Swift and others, is it stops you in your track and it makes you ask yourself, what am I doing? Am I no longer even conceiving of these people as human beings? That says a lot about how I view them, but then it also says a lot about me. And it's that upsetting moment, which I think is really why Amada's proposal is so effective, um, because you have to stop and say, okay, I understand why this is horrifying, but I also understand that this is the path I'm on, and that's where it logically ends. It logically ends with cannibalism of babies. Not a place people want to go, uh, for all kinds of good reasons. But anyway, Jonathan Swift's Modest Proposal, um, a great piece. I hope you read it before you listen to me, because you got to have that gut experience with the text uh, to really get the power out of this. And it's kind of a, you know, you read it once, and it's, and it's not something that every time you come back to it after this video and after you've read it, it's going to be less of an effect. But it's that initial contact with irony that is so valuable. And once you're aware of it, you want more of it. And you start trying to be more aware of it in culture. Um, and we need it. Uh, we need it, I would say, to all hang together because we're very ready to treat each other in awful ways. So we need Swift kind of cracking the whip, I think, uh, when, we, when we go too far. But that's just my opinion. Anyway, hope you enjoyed the reading. And I look forward to hearing what you have to say.